Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this time we're working with my City Streets kit, adding a racing countdown intro sequence and a rudimentary lap and race timer. I'm going to try something a little different with this video. I got a suggestion from Shlominator2000 a little while back to show the final product before the tutorial process. I have gotten this suggestion before, and I'm curious what the analytics will look like. So I'm giving it a shot. So final product first and don't bomb out after because the tutorial will follow. So we begin with a countdown to start. This is a work in progress as far as the visuals go, but the process itself is something we'll go over. Overall, it's pretty simple. Some cameras, some keyframes, you get the picture. The meat of the logic is in the race and lap timer. We have two objectives here. The first is to keep track of the overall time and we're doing that in the upper right hand corner. The second is the lap timer, and that will not be visible until the lap is complete, like now. We also are going to separate times for all of the laps, and we want to have those displayed to us. This is a basic setup, it doesn't deal with certain easy exploits, that will be addressed by adding a checkpoint system in the next video in this series. And then at the end of the final lap, we want the race timer to stop and provide a final time for scoring. The first thing we'll do is put down a microchip to hold everything. I make it a big microchip because it's pretty important and we don't want to lose track of it. The countdown to the race is a sequence and when you think sequences you should think timelines. I will put down a timeline and start working in that. The first thing I want to accomplish with this sequence is to give some padding on the level loading to ensure that everything is ready to go before things start happening. I'm going to add a bunch of cameras and the simplest way to get a little extra time for the load animation to run through before our logic starts is to let the first cam run for a second or two before doing anything else. The objective with the other cameras is to emphasize the countdown, so I want to switch cameras on each count. The count is 3, 2, 1, go. Since we have four steps, we'll have four cameras. There are the four cameras we will need. You might notice those changing as I jump around. Most of that is fine tuning. If I make any significant changes, I'll stop and explain them. I'm going through each camera to remove imps and player control and also to add black bars for a cinematic feel. For the countdown, we need a visual representation of the numbers, so we'll want some number displayers and a text displayer for the word go. You'll notice that except for the padding on the first camera, everything lasts one second in the timeline to correspond to the countdown. Because of the camera padding, our first event will occur at one second rather than starting with the first camera at zero. You can do anything you like with the style of these displayers. I'm mostly just messing around here as the whole thing is a work in progress and I will likely change these later to match whatever menu style scheme I come up with in the future when this is closer to being a full game. And then once again adding those elements at one second intervals. I want the countdown to come flying at the screen and to accomplish this I'll use keyframes. The initial keyframe will have the displayer start very small at the middle of the screen with some opacity. With the second keyframe, I'll make the displayer as large as it can get and then turn all of the elements to 0% opacity. You want to make sure you scale the displayer first because you won't be able to see it when all of the opacity sliders are 0%. And then I'll start doing the same thing with the other displayer gadgets. I probably play tested this sequence 20 times while I was working on it. It can be difficult to get short sequences to work correctly because the smallest thing will throw them off. One issue I was having was that the transition to player control in the cars cam was really obvious and not satisfying. I also wanted the player to be able to go when the word showed up on the screen, not when it was done. To fix that, I'm using a switch in the timeline. There will be a few different steps here, but what I'm doing overall is removing the blockage of player controls from the last camera gadget. 
In the place of that, I'll use a switch to determine when controls are blocked during the last two seconds of the timeline. Then I'll shorten the last camera by one second, so the combination of all that means that the player will gain control at the same time Go appears on screen, and the camera will switch to the car's camera. Then I'll clone the switch and set it to trigger when the player gets control. This will act as the start of our race timer. I interrupt player controls with the first switch by hooking it to the disable controls input on the controller sensor of the car. The first thing we need for the race timer is a timer. The nice thing about a start and stop timer contraption in Dreams is that it's pretty portable across applications. So we can use the same concept for both our race timer and our lap timers. I'll be triggering this with a switch in a timeline, but the timer wants to see a pulsed input to start, so I'll use a signal manipulator and set it to pulse on input on. The output of the signal manipulator will run to the start input of the timer. Then the switch output inside the timeline will run to the input of the signal manipulator. You could probably forego the switch and put the signal manipulator into the timeline, but I find this way a little more visually informative. So next we need a variable to hold the information coming from the timer so we can do stuff with it later when we need to. Variables have two components, the variable itself and the variable modifier. We will wire the output of the timer to the input of the variable modifier which is at the default condition of set when powered. This will send the information to the variable when the modifier gadget turns on. The connection between the variable and the modifier is wireless, so we don't need to hook anything up. However, we do need to name the variable and then put the variable name into the modifier so that it knows which variable it's supposed to modify. I'm going to add a couple of number displayers set to display time. One will be connected to the current time output on the timer. The other will be connected to the output of the variable. That is most of the setup for the race timer. Now I'll start on the lap timer. To start the lap timer, we need a trigger zone to determine when the lap has begun. We can also use that zone to determine when a lap has ended and when the race has ended. The trigger zone should be positioned exactly at the start finish line. It should be wide enough so that the car can't go around it and high enough that the car can't fly over it in a freak accident. It should be deep enough so that it's impossible for the car to travel completely through it in one frame. Under things to detect in the trigger zone will go with possessable player controllers. I'm going to run the output from the trigger zone to the move to next output tab on a selector. This is how we'll switch between laps. You want two more selector outputs than laps. This will act as a state machine. A will be the starting state and will do nothing. E will be the end state and will handle end of the race stuff like recording times and shutting off the lap trigger zone. The in-betweens will each handle whatever happens during a given lap. For now, whatever happens during a given lap is that the lap timer runs. Except for variable name, the lap timers are identical, so I'm going to build a function of sorts that we can make portable and easily copy. Minus some structural stuff, the basic layout we have for the race timer is all we need for each lap. So I'm going to copy all that and put the copy into a microchip. From there, I'll add the structural stuff that was missing. We want to make this a complete package we can drop into Logic and hook up without having to open it up and mess with it. I'm placing these input nodes to give the microchip some inputs we can hook up when it's closed. These will start the timer Capture the time at the end of the lap and display the time on screen continuously after the lap is completed. The start timer node gets hooked up to the signal manipulator that starts the timer. 
The signal to record the time will run to a signal manipulator set to pulse. The output of that gadget will in turn be connected to the power of the variable modifier. This will cause the variable modifier to turn on for one frame and send the time from the timer during that frame to the variable. The signal to display the time is somewhat similar. Again, we'll use a signal manipulator, but this time we'll set it to toggle it on. Then we'll run the output of the signal manipulator to its freeze input. This will cause the signal manipulator to send out a continuous signal after it's received a signal and then ignore input after that. We'll also run the output of the signal manipulator to the power of the number displayer. This way when a signal is received, the displayer will turn on and stay on. That logic is now completely contained and we can simply clone it for each lap. So for each lap timer microchip, you need to go in and create a unique name for the variable and then make sure the variable modifier matches up. Let's hook up these lap timers. Remember the A output on the selector is reserved for whatever happens before the first lap starts. In this case right now that is nothing. The B output is the first lap state so the timer should start when B becomes active. Accordingly we've hooked the B output up to the start timer input on the lap timer for the first lap. When the car hits the trigger zone again to end the first lap and start the second lap, the selector will switch from the B output to the C output. Because of this, we run the C output on the selector to the record time and display time inputs for the first lap timer microchip because the first lap has ended. But we also run the C output to the start timer input on the lap timer for the second lap because the second lap has begun. In this way, you can connect up to eight consecutive laps to a single selector. Our last selector output is the end of race state, so it records and displays the timer for the last lap and also displays and records the time for the entire race. I'm also going to hook it up so that it disables the trigger zone. That way nothing is connected that will remove the selector from the end of race state. The race timer wiring has a subtlety that the lap timers don't need to contend with. With the race timer, we are displaying the race time continuously during the race. However, when it's over, we want to give the illusion that the timer has stopped and display the final time. That's why we have two number displayers hooked up to the race timer logic. We also need to pulse power to the variable modifier like we did with the lap timers. First we'll take care of the trigger zone with the selector's E output running to a NOT gate. That then runs to the power of the trigger zone. The logical statement is, when the race is not over, the lap trigger zone is active, which makes sense. Up next is the end of race timer display. This is handled like the lap timers, but we don't need a signal manipulator because once the race is over, the selector's E output is on continuously. We'll run the selector's E output through a NOT gate to the power of the number displayer that displays the race time continuously during the race. In this way, the time for the timer will display continuously while the race is running and then switch over to the saved time in the variable at the end of the race. I could have used just one NOT gate there and ran the signals for the lap trigger zone and the race time timer from that instead of two separately, but I didn't. Oh well. And now it's time for some blooper bugs. Here the race timer starts just fine but stops at 5 seconds. Issue. Timers are set to 5 seconds by default. Solution, set your timers to the maximum allowed in instances like this so you don't have to deal with the timer completing. Bug number two. Upon completing the second lap, the second lap time is overlaying the first lap time. Solution, make sure your number displayers are set up correctly. All right, let's see some of that final product again. Well, sort of final because this is not finished. 
So in this video we covered a countdown intro sequence and race and lap timers. But we are not done because we need checkpoints to let the player know how they're doing during the lap and also as a security measure to keep them from triggering laps without completing them. And it would also be nice to take our recorded times and post them to a scoreboard to let our players compete. All that and more coming soon, but that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.